Thanks, Ian. Good morning, everyone. So, um, as Ian's just pre-positioned, I'm going to touch on some issues that sort of link to what we've heard in the preceding session, actually, from Dominic around technology and where the future might take us as an industry, but probably act as a bridge in terms of where we are at the moment and what that journey might look like, and particularly why we need to change. And perhaps we've been here before at various times around uh, sensing that we need to improve what we do as an industry, but we've never really grasped that opportunity. So I'm going to set out what I believe is the case for that change, um, particularly with reference to the labour model and the particular way in which we approach construction and the wider business model as well. So just to kick things off, I'm just going to set a bit of background context, which is, um, covers some, uh, some of the elements of what uh, is in my government review. And that relates to what I call 10 symptoms of failure in the construction industry. And many of these issues have been covered many times before by lots of very eminent people um, and will not be a surprise to many of you. The, the issue for me is that or even though these are deep-seated systemic problems that we face, not just in the UK, these are generic issues, I would suggest, across most construction industries across the world, actually. Um, the dynamic that's actually facing us going forward is slightly different that makes certain of these issues take on a different significance. And I think you'll notice there's only nine issues there. The tenth one for me is the one that, when I was writing my review, uh, I sensed had a different significance to perhaps um, when this has been looked at in the past, and that's the issue of resources, the workforce size um, and demographic profile of our workforce. And I suppose that really links to um, the, uh, the poor industry image that you'll see in the bottom left there, because what we're about to enter into, certainly in the UK, and I would suggest it's also an issue for Ireland, uh, is a period of time when we're going to be losing more people every year than we're actually gaining in terms of new entrants to the industry. So the sustainability of our business model, the sustainability of the labour intensity of what we do is being massively put under threat. And my prognosis is that the resiliency of our industry, and lots of people talk about construction being very resilient, we operate in a highly dynamic, volatile environment, particularly in relation to economic cycles. Um, and we've shaped ourselves as an industry pretty much in response to all of those issues you see there, the 10 symptoms of failure. Um, we, we've shaped ourselves to be fleet of foot, to be flexible, um, to ride the wave, if you like, of boom and bust, um, which is what the industry, um, unfortunately, historically has suffered from. But my suggestion is that's going to be much, much more difficult going forward um, and for reasons I'll come on to. And I believe what that does, it characterises a position where we are now, and this is all about timing, um, effectively as a burning platform, a burning platform for change that we perhaps haven't had before. We've had lots of previous rallying calls to change the way that we deliver, to improve what we do, but none of it has really resonated and, and had long-term effects. We've always reverted back to type, and my belief is that we now do, truly do have a burning platform that um, must, in my view, precipitate change. Just looking at that workforce um, size and demographic issues. So these, this is data from the UK. Um, so the, the left-hand graph shows the 2011 census data um, for uh, the UK construction workforce. It shows a mode position um, pretty much in the middle age grouping um, of our population. But what is now projected to happen over the next decade up to the next census is that the, um, the workforce is going to age progressively. So we're going to have more people retiring every year than are entering our industry. And those bars are going to move to the right-hand side. So we expect to see um, a shift to the right in the next census. On the right-hand side, you'll see two graphs that show um, the link between um, how many people we need to deliver uh, in the case of the UK, 250,000 homes a year, which is the political target that's been banded around, and the people we'll, we'll probably expect to have going forward based on the attrition profile. And what it shows, the red line is effectively the full-time equivalence of the workforce purely in residential. This is a, this is a sector based view on housing, um, which is about 350,000, 400,000 full-time equivalents. And you see the yellow bars progressively decline to the right-hand side as we lose more and more people going forward. And it's quite clear in Ireland you have similar challenges. You already have uh, a shortfall in the construction workforce, particularly in the, the light of 
um, what is a booming economy. You've taken a long time to recover from, from the downturn, but you're now in full, um, in full flow and your construction workforce is under pressure. And what's also interesting is you seem to have many of the symptoms, if you like, of the aging workforce profile that I just set out for the UK. So this is some data I got. It's a little bit um, historic. It's 20, 20, 2006 to 2011. But if you look at the comparison around the age groupings um, in that five-year period, you'll see that the younger age group is becoming a smaller proportion of the overall and the older age group is increasing. So that suggests an aging profile running through the construction workforce. And this is not just a construction issue, this is a much wider issue across other economic sectors as well. But in the UK, we have another level of risk that um, is facing us, which is about Brexit. And it's, um, it's very clear that the construction uh, industry in the UK has a massive um, uh, reliance on migrant workforce and this is a, a graphic that shows uh, London's workforce in isolation and London has very specific issues where this is elevated that shows that 45% of all construction workforce in London is non-UK of which 27% is EU so that creates a real risk beyond the demographic profile of what our workforce might look like in the future related to the article 15 negotiations that um, are currently in flow and when you combine that with the age profile um, of the workforce. What's clear is that actually the, the background um, average position around the, the age of the, the UK construction workforce is being affected by migration. So much of the younger demographic working in the, the UK construction industry is actually migrant labour. So if you strip that out, the actual the background domestic profile of the age, um, of the age profile is even older than the figures suggest. So we have this double whammy effect, if you like, which is creating a risk around resources going forward. Um, in Ireland, it's interesting to see that as your economy is recovered uh, and looking back at what happened pre, pre crash, um, your reliance on migrant labour also ebbs and flows in relation to topping up your, your domestic capacity. So, and you'll see in the, um, in the move from 2013 to 2014, uh, the beginning of the Irish component relative to the EU component reducing. So that shows a clear sign that the migrant dependency is an issue you have as well. But you don't have Brexit as a problem. And in reality, Ireland could be a net beneficiary of Brexit in terms of bringing back and repatriating workers that are currently in the UK and actually attracting um, European nationals to Ireland as well. So I'm just going to quickly remind um, everyone of what my challenge was around my review. Modernise or Die, quite a controversial title, but I chose it very deliberately, not just to get attention, but actually to set out what I do think is pretty much an existential challenge for us going forward. I'm not suggesting the industry as a whole is going to die. We're always going to have a construction industry, but I'm talking really at individual corporate level, what the challenges are going forward for the health of businesses and the sustainability of business models that effectively, um, I think, uh, could create a real issue in terms of what we do need to do to, to future-proof ourselves. So my review really talked about three key themes. The first was a need for clear leadership um, and institutional reforms and three parties being brought together in a much more integrated way, which is around clients of the industry, not just about construction, but people who commission construction work. Um, and uh, the industry itself, obviously the supply chain, main contractors, subcontractors, suppliers, consultants and government. And government, uh, I'll come on to in a second in terms of their role. And really to drive a productivity led change agenda which then dictates what future skills look like. And I think it's very easy to look at construction and say we just need more of the same to increase our output. And what I'm suggesting is that actually that's not the case anymore. We need to start responding to different stimuli for change, some of which Dominic covered in his um, previous uh, presentation. But even in the here and now, there's a need for something different. And as I say, government, I think, has got a key role to play in, in initiating that change. Uh, and I think that has relevance here in Ireland in terms of some of the things we're starting to see in the UK around the government role in an industrial strategy. And I heard that mentioned um, earlier in terms of uh, what, what that looks like here, I think is highly relevant. And probably the one theme that sat behind my review in terms of what I was suggesting the industry needed to do was to um, move to what I call a higher level of pre-manufactured value in the construction projects that we undertake. And that effectively is just the ratio between what we do offsite compared to what we do on site. And that doesn't mean modular construction. Everyone, a lot of people have taken this as being, it's all about modular, it's not. Modular is one solution, but this is more about labor intensity, it's about efficiency, productivity, and the interface between what's manufactured, um, pre-manufactured, and what's actually installed on site. 
but our industry has spectacularly failed to respond to any of those positive stimuli, as I said, that we've had in the past, and there's been some some very well-known reports, certainly in the UK, such as the Laven report, the Egan report from the 1990s, where it didn't really have any long-lasting impact around our industry. So positive stimuli, for me, we don't seem to react to that. We are also, as an industry, highly fragmented. So the ability to mobilize ourselves and to act as one is pretty much impossible. But even if we were to act as sort of 50, 60% of the industry, I think that would be enough to st start uh, driving strategic change. So the issue for me now is whether that burning platform that I've just set out is enough of a negative stimulus for industry to realize that it has to change. And I'm not sure, actually, despite everything I've just said, that it is enough. So I would suggest there's something else going on, and it's something that I believe has developed in the last 12 months since my report has been published. Purely coincidental, but it's an interesting new driver for how we might embrace change, and that's discontent. And what do I mean by discontent? So I think, firstly, from within the industry. So if you look at some of the headlines that we've seen in, in the UK around financial results from some of the big players in the construction industry, it's a catalog of poor performance either losses or thin, wafer-thin margins. And this is after a period of three or four years of extended economic growth, and you would expect people to be making money. So if we cannot make money in the environment that we've been through the last few years, when can we? And it suggests that under the bonnet in the construction industry, there's something pretty seriously wrong with the basic model. But there's also another level of discontent, and that's coming from consumers. So again, Dominic referenced this TripAdvisor culture, the ratings culture that we're starting to move towards in terms of digital society. This is starting to play out in the UK in the home building industry. So we've had some pretty um, big headlines in the, f in the last 10 months from the likes of Bovis Homes, Bellway. We've had housing associations impacted by poor traditional construction quality. We've had a big scandal in the Scottish schools building programme, all related to poor workmanship on site. And actually, this is a headline from last weekend here in Ireland. It appears that you have similar issues linked to periods when you're in a boom and you're building and lots of, of, of output, but actually quality is suffering. So this is a, a deep-seated issue around the, the ability to build quantity with quality being attained. And the consumer backlash from that is now growing. But in the UK, we have another stimulus for change, which is pretty much unprecedented. And that's the tragedy that occurred in June in London at the Grenfell Tower. And I believe that is going to put a focus on our industry and some of the failings of our industry in a way that perhaps we haven't seen before. Something I certainly couldn't have foreseen when I wrote my review. Um, and it's going to build the pressure on looking at what, how we do things and how we can be more effective and how we can improve ultimately. And I think the analysis we're going to see, and there's obviously lots of things going on, and I'm not going to prejudge the public inquiry uh, and all the other things that are going to be related to it, but I think we're going to see a lot of focus around various strands of our industry, which um, are on this slide here. I'm not going to go through them all, and you may recognise some of them. You might not recognise some of them. But for me, they're all issues that I believe are being talked about. Some of them are being swept under the carpet, and now is the time to address them because they're actually they're going to be put front and centre, and they're going to be politicised. As I say, this whole discontent from the consumer has now taken on mainstream media proportions in the UK. So we've got TV programmes, documentaries, exposés. We've got this whole social media environment playing out where there's people who are not happy posting stuff on the internet, creating chat rooms, creating reputational and brand risk for developers and house builders in a way we haven't seen before. This whole issue about bringing quantity alongside quality is now also taking political um, significance. This is a report that was um, published last year in, in, in the UK for, by the all-party parliamentary group, More Homes, Fewer Complaints. It sort of got published last summer and then sort of it went off the radar. But what's happened in the last year, 18 months, has brought this back on the radar. Um, we have a housing minister talking very explicitly about quality and lots of stuff is happening back in London with the RIBA and the, the architectural profession, design professions to keep an eye on that and to drive quantity and quality. And here in Ireland, I understand that you've, there's increasing interest and there's legislation potentially moving forward around upping the bar in terms of how we attain quality in terms of the site trades and people working in the professions and trades um, through licensing and registration something that we've looked at in the past in the UK, but all linked to upping the standard of how we deliver. Just to sort of set the scene as to why I think our industry struggles so much, 
I use this relationship um, statement quite a lot. I think there's four proportional links between failure around design, procurement, and construction and our industry, which is the fact we design everything from scratch, virtually in every job. We're too site labor intensive, and we're massively fragmented, both vertically and horizontally. And I think lots of people have said, well, what's the answer to that? So you've already heard about BIM today as being a digital solution to how we move forward. Lots of people will talk about collaboration and collaborative contracts. And in my mind, yes, they're absolutely part of the solution, but in some quarters, they've become the end rather than the means, and they are enablers. And we've got to try and hardwire that back into how our industry operates. We all work in the real world, and it's how do you take those concepts and move it forward? We need a holistic strategy. And I think what I've seen with BIM, and you know, it's, it's sort of covered by Dominic in the previous session around the fact that lots of the focus has been on the design phase of, of construction and 3D modeling, clash detection, coordination, but when you combine that with a competitive tendered procurement process that we all tend to still use, um, and an analog construction process, pretty much what we do in the construction sites is still analog, it's not dig digitized, then that is effectively gonna hit a glass ceiling on what you can do. And that's why I suggest that BIM in isolation without moving digital onto the construction process is lipstick on a pig. And um, I hesitate to use that analogy, but I do really think you're actually not dealing with the core issue, which is the construction process on the site and how you're going to drive digital into that. I also think there's a need for integrating our delivery models a lot, a lot better. So this is a traditional construction organizational chart, a client appoint, appointing a tier one main contractor with a consultant team with a whole multitude of subcontractors sitting behind what's clear and it's been played out certainly in the UK in the last two or three years, is that that vertical tra um, fragmentation and all the transactions that are happening, contracts sitting behind, uh, sitting between people, um, and lots of horizontal fragmentation, trade silos, designers off to one side. Effectively, the advisors sort of advising, but not really in control, and certainly not owning the outcome. Maybe a contractor, if he's on a lump sum contract, on paper owning the outcome, but not really in control anymore. And that, for me, is a symptom of the fact that that model doesn't work. And it doesn't work because, actually, the, we've lost control over the productive process. So as we've got into a skills crisis in the UK and we're under more and more of a challenge to deliver sufficient resources at high quality, the risk of delivery is getting greater and greater. Hence, I think, all of the financial results we're seeing. We're seeing problems in terms of cost, time, and quality on projects that where people are holding that risk, it's now starting to hit the bottom line. And I see that as not as a phased or transitional thing. This is a long-term structural change that we need to phase, it, um, phase into. So my suggestion around moving forward is a much more integrated procurement model that enables everyone to get around the table. And this won't be news to a lot of people who've looked at um, collaborative approaches. And it's, for me, it's a, it's a version of alliancing. It's a version of alliancing that all you also uses more pre-manufacturing. So you're not just putting a collaborative contract around a traditional construction process. As I've said, I think that will get you diminishing returns. You have more manufactured content. You might have a system in place. You might have a hybrid approach, which is both traditional and off-site led that comes together, which I think is where a lot of these solutions lie. But everyone's around the table at day one. You're integrated. You're in an alliance. You might link that to programs of work, whether that be housing or, or, or infrastructure. And what's interesting is the opportunities to wrap insurance products around that to simulate lump sum certainty for external funders. And importantly, the need to get an operator or a manager of a building asset part of that process, which very rarely do we see. And digital becomes the enabler around the whole thing. So that's where digital comes in. It's not the, the end, it's the means to the end. So what's been happening in the UK uh, in the last 12 months? Well, we've had a review of the industrial training boards. It's a particular thing we have in the UK. The construction industry has a training board which is the equivalent of your national training fund, your NTF levy, I think you pay as employers, but we have one ring fence for construction. So a levy, uh, a review is about to be announced in the next two weeks, which hopefully will enable more strategic change around training and skills. We've had a Build UK, which is a big organiza trade organizational body, rep body representing the supply chain, bringing developer clients into its membership. So a much more joined up discussion now happening around the integrated leadership that I mentioned. The CITB I just referenced in the last week has been voted for to remain because we have a three-year three consensus vote in the UK to retain the concept of CITB. Industry has backed it, and it's a conditional backing based on being fit for purpose in the future. So a real platform for change in terms of strategic thinking on skills and training, as I say. A couple of the reports that have come out of CITB are all about future skills. 
It's not about bricklaying and carpentry. This is about where we're moving to in terms of off-site manufacture, hybrid working, but also embracing augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality not as a training tool, but also to reflect how we're likely to be working in the future. We've seen policy change. We've accelerated construction, which is a way in which the government's trying to influence the way in which homes are built. It's not just saying we want more homes, it's actually saying we want them built this way, which I think has got a lot of relevance for Ireland. We've seen the housing white paper, which unusually for a policy paper has covered um, a lot around construction and innovation. Usually you just have papers that are referenced around uh, land and planning and leasehold reform. There was lots in this paper all about construction. Same with this uh, CLG Select Committee report, which gives cross-party consensus in the UK now to modernisation, which is really important. We've had a formal response to my review, which was largely supportive. And we've got some real evidence in London, who have got very, very specific problems around housing, that they're going to embrace the time agenda, uh, the change agenda, rather. So what are we seeing in the UK? We're seeing a gradual move from industry towards a different way of working. All of these participants here, developers, contractors, institutions, public sector bodies, in the last year have all done something differently and they're moving on a journey which suggests that the oil tank is starting to change course, which is, which is positive. We have an industrial strategy, which is really important. So we've got holistic thinking from our Construction Leadership Council, which I think is going the equivalent of what you're trying to create through your construction sector group, your CSG. And these are the three themes that we're, we're, we're concentrating on, all of which cover what I've been speaking about, including procurement, skills for the future, et cetera, et cetera. And demand aggregation, procurement models, and design standardization sit at the heart of how we're going to move to a different delivery model. So in closing, I think my report has created some waves, and it was always the intention to do that, but in, hopefully in a constructive way that enables the industry to be aware of the problems that are coming, and I think many of those problems are relevant for here in Ireland. We have new drivers for change, as I said, around the skills crisis, those levels of discontent that we haven't seen before, and a great opportunity around technology. We've got policy starting to shift in a certain direction, an opportunity for Ireland to replicate that. Momentum's building, but we're not there yet around a tipping point. So my call is that what we're starting as a journey in the UK, I believe, has got massive application for you here in the Republic of Ireland. Um, and I would commend you all to be thinking in this way around strategic change and modernisation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for just news breaking. For anyone who hasn't heard it, the High Court has ruled in favour of Apple, so the data centre will thankfully be getting built very shortly. Uh, not, I think we can all agree, not, not, not before time. Mark, modernise or die. I suppose you could have been talking about the Irish construction industry. Yeah, and as I've just said, I think there's some very, very strong parallels with, um, between the UK and the Irish construction industry. And not, actually, not just those two countries. This is some... There's some very generic issues that I've seen on my travels abroad. So in, in the last year, uh, I've, I've been invited to other parts of the world and we are, we're having very similar conversations about the, um, the challenges that, that we face as an industry. Um, this whole labor model thing is at the heart of it and the need to embrace a different approach. This image issue that I, I spoke about at the beginning of, our, uh, of my, my presentation is a, is a real issue across the board around societal change, uh, generational change around kids not necessarily wanting to come into construction anymore and we we need to try and evolve well, just, that by just, but just talk about that how, how do you change that so i think some of it is related to what i've just described around modernization if you change the narrative of what our industry represents and what you potentially could do as a career and open that up as a spectrum of opportunity from a manufacturing led approach to a hybrid approach to traditional construction and let's not forget craft skills and artisan skills are going to be really important going forward we're not saying that's binary it's about additionality of capacity and techniques, then you create more attraction around embracing digital. Many kids now want to work in so sectors. you make it about technology yeah. as opposed to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, if you're, part of the problem is this stereotypical perception of a cold, wet building site, um, poor working conditions, health and safety or whatever. Well, if you can attack that by changing the basic delivery model, then you will make our industry more attractive. I suppose one of the issues that comes up time and time again, and particularly going th having gone through what lots of people in this room have gone through over the past 10, 15 years, uh, and as we try to get back building now, is we, they've had a survivalist mindset, because they've had to have a survivalist mindset, you know, project after project. And it's, it's, 
it's that sort of thinking that's got people through the last 10 years, but your argument would be we need to change that survivalist mindset now. Yeah, and I've got a lot of, em of empathy with uh, why that is. As, as I've described, lo lots of the reasons the industry is like it is is in response to the environment that it works in. And it's a highly cyclical market, um, and lots of the reticence to invest or to think long term or to skill to train and skill up people is because they're actually then they're always waiting for the next downturn so one of my requests in my report to the uk government and it's equally applicable here in ireland is to be a bit more smarter in terms of policy around demand planning to enable more smooth demand to avoid boom and bust to turn the tap on in terms of public spending and infrastructure and housing if there's a downturn in private sector spend you don't necessarily want the two to co coincide because it overheats the in industry. What you want is the ability to, to smooth the, the yeah. peaks and troughs such that you have consistency of demand and investment. Yeah. And th but that requires construction companies to keep on investing in the sort of technologies and advancement change that, that, that you're proposing. Yeah, and I think it, this is chicken and egg. So I think it, the companies will if they see that steady demand. So it's all about setting out political policies that shape future workload. Um, I, in my particular business, I work in housing, so if, uh, everything I do is residential, and there's some great examples of how policy and stimuli in terms of um, uh, building programs and in the budget this week, I, I see that there's been a, a push on the direct commission, direct building program for social housing. Yep. That is a tool that can be used not just to create stability of demand going forward, but actually to influence how homes are built in, in, in Ireland. And there's some work that I'm doing at the moment with the UK government, which is to set through procurement rules by which it, 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 it it um, dictates minimum pre-manufactured content. So lots of what I'm talking about, you can drive into procurement in a nice, easy way, so you don't suddenly set a bar that no one can achieve, but you drive an industry towards a journey of slightly changing the model and modernizing it, it itself, yeah. as I suggest. I just want to put it out to the audience. Uh, there, are, there are microphones. Is there anybody who would like, before, before I, I ask a final question of Mark, ask to put something to Mark from the floor? If you can, I see a gentleman there, if you can just Say who you are and where you're from, and then address your question to Mark. That'd be great. Hi, Mark. Um, I'm Simon Sherman. Uh, the company's Integrated Balling Systems. We have um, a base in Limerick and in London, um, looking to set up a factory over here. The, you talk about, um, first of all, great presentation. And I've also read the report um, back home anyway. Um, the biggest, we produce um, the hybrid, modular hybrid systems that you were talking about. And the, the, these systems, they uh, have time, significant time savings for construction companies. Um, and they have significant material um, savings for construction companies. And they are compliant. They hit all the U values that we've got to do and, and um, all that sort of thing. The biggest barrier that we have um, to entry is getting that across to the client, whereby he can see that we're coming in at X amount per meter. His traditional build is... He, in a part, you know, his QS. And you t you've, up there, you've got names all over the place of these big companies that are all on your, on, I see them all around here, sponsoring this place. I've been in to see them and they come back with the same answer. You're more expensive, you're too expensive. Okay, so while all these guys are um, sponsoring this and doing all the right thing, that they should be from their, um, you know, from, a <laughs> from their own PR point of view, there's still a reticence to listen at the lower level where you've got the QSs that don't want to be accountable for making that decision okay. to actually go with something that could scare them. Okay, thanks, Mark. Is that your experience, sir? Yeah, I absolutely recognise that. Uh, as, and this is all about leadership. So where I've seen things change is where the boardroom has decided to go in a certain direction and to drive it down into the business at site level you'll see reticence because actually it's about business as usual, it's about comfort zone, it's the way they've always done things, it's not their fault. But strategic thinking needs strategic leadership and driving change into a business right down to site level. So you know, QSs and other advisors are massively important for clients as well because there's a client pool towards demanding something differently and all too often you see a client being protected by a gaggle of advisors saying, well, no, we don't want to do that, we'll do it this way because that's what we're used to. So we need to bust all of that open if we're going to move the industry forward. And there's some interesting precedents for that starting to happen, certainly in the UK. Okay. Well, look, I want to thank Mark for, for his presentation, for coming across and, and for bringing those views. I think it was a really, really interesting and thought-provoking speech with some great ideas. So we're all going to have to modernise our diet. I just want to thank you, Mark, for your time. Uh,